Hello, my name is Andrew Gary and welcome to Seismic Sound Off, in-depth conversations in applied geophysics. In this episode, the keynote address and SEG President's State of the Society address from the opening session at the 88th Annual Meeting in Anaheim, California. SEG President Nancy House presents the State of the Society address and then introduces the keynote speaker from that event, Daryl Willis. Daryl is Vice President, Oil, Gas, and Energy at Google Cloud. He spoke on the cost of status quo, get on board or get left behind. Read his full biography at seg.org slash podcast. The episode ends with a Q&A from the audience. Now, Nancy House and Daryl Willis. Geophysicists have the tools and knowledge to better our planet. From energy to water to disaster prediction and mitigation, applied geophysics is integral to bringing large portions of humanity out of poverty and into the modern era. But geosciences can contribute to the solution, but we need to ensure that the younger and next generation brings their talents to bear on the subject. Energy poverty, what role does geoscience have in bettering the lives of the populations around the planet? This is a a slide that I took from uh, Richard Hukla from the uh, Energy and Earth Sciences graduate program at the BEG. It illustrates how much of the world still lives in darkness. And that's a, a key indicator of the poverty around the world as well. Even some of the areas are still dark, but there is light in offshore uh, areas. So how did this energy mix change over time? You can see that in the 1850s, most of the energy was supplied by wood, with some by coal, and coal continued to replace wood through the years. The late 1800s, oil started coming into the mix with the introduction of oil exploration and production. Then natural gas started to be used and followed by nuclear and just towards the turn of the century, more and more of the renewables. As the energy demand across the world also illustrates that in the organization of economic cooperation, OECD companies, countries, the usage of the demand for energy is going to level off and potentially even decrease over the uh, next few years. But energy increase, the energy demand will continue to increase for a lot of the other countries. The mix is also going to be um, continuing. So if you look at the mix between oil and gas, they will continue to rise, but at, at a slower pace. And the other mixes will, will increase fairly quickly as, as well. But in the end, less than 25% will be, surpre- will be replaced by renewable energy. Fresh water availability is going to become an increasingly in- important Uh, entity as we go forward. This is a GRACE map that stands for the gravity, um, I'm I'm losing my acronym, it's a gravity recovery and climate experiment headed by NASA, but it illustrates areas where groundwater depletion is becoming critical. The graph on the right shows how the models of of water usage are continuing to decrease with modeling of different mitigation measures carried out in the future and what what impact that may may have. How did we start to get into the energy business? Early on, the earliest oil fields were found by random drilling, luck, and then when you had a discovery, you drilled as closely as you could to the the next one or to the last one. This is the time when the anticlinal theory of geologic um, trapping and migration came into into being, and early geologists could be found mapping surface anticlines by 
but only about 8% of all the wells were, were found by this method in, in between 19, 1871 and, eight, and 1945. So geophysics actually came into being and came into usage in the early 1920s, and two of the SEG awards are named after the early inventors of the seismic reflection method. You see here the, the initial experiment done outside of Oklahoma City where the method was used to map the, the subsurface um, structure of the Viola limestone. There's an early 2D record. Geophysicists were known as doodlebuggers because they used magic to, to find oil and gas. Between the 1960s and the 1980s, I think, was the, um, the age of enlightenment. Sig significant digital and technological breakthroughs enabled the seismic method to become more and more utilized. The uh, advent of digital recording and multifold data led for much cleaner and much clearer pictures of the subsurface. The theories of of oil and gas migration and entrapment became more um, more sophisticated. So if you look at the, the discoveries and how they, they rolled out between 1871 and 1925, when you just were beginning to understand that geophysics could, could contribute, most of the fields were, were for, found by random drilling, looking close to the next one. Subsurface structures were mapped from surface geology or surface seeps. Then from 1926 to 1945, you started to see the introduction and the usage of geophysics. So that by 1945, almost all the, the fields were located by the use of either the seismic methodology or gravity to a lesser extent. So about over one third of the 220 fields that were identified and, and located in the first 75 years were found with the use of geophysics. So by the late 1980s and early 1990s, the main constraint was the compute power and the number of channels and et cetera available to, to record and process seismic. It was common for most of the, the oil companies to be partnered with the major computer providers. So you would find Cray computers and big IBM research centers located in many of the the major oil companies. This was the beginning of integrated exploration teams and where you had reservoir geologists, geologists, reservoir engineers, and geophysicists and managers working together to identify and, produce and um, explore for oil and gas. By the 2000s, I think there was a uh, somewhat of a revolution. We had managed to solve a lot of the imaging challenges through application of technology, and we started to expand into what information was encoded in the, the wavelet itself. So we were able to start to sort massive amounts of data into azimuthal orientations and pull out rock properties and, and mechanic and fluid properties from, from the seismic response. Then uh, a known phenomenon was introduced to further integrate the engineering with the geophysics side, taking you back to almost first principles, and that was the introduction and the use of microseismic to find, to identify where hydraulic fracturing fluids may be penetrating and, and causing the rock to break. So how did SEG play into these um, advancements in the past, the present, and the future? SEG was started in 1930 by 30 members and one, one woman who was integral in not only the founding and the publication of the first earliest papers, but she also was critical to the, the survival of SEG through World War II, keeping, keeping it alive and going. 
as um, the, the first publication of geophysics, our flagship journal, occurred in 1936. And as Dan mentioned, my first SEG meeting was in 1978 at, in San Francisco. I was two years old, but... <sighs> The membership has grown from its initial 30 members to over 30,000 in, in 2008. We seem to be going down a little bit, but we're not sure whether or not that was we were double counting back in the olden days, 10 years ago. So our global membership now stands at about 20,000, with the majority in U.S. and Canada, followed by um, Europe, Asia, Middle East, and North Africa and the rest of the world. This diverse mem membership is well represented through our regional advisory committees and our subsidiary offices in Dubai and the Middle East, Dubai and Beijing, and numerous sections, associated societies, and student chapters all over the world. What are geophysicists? I see us as treasure hunters and problem solvers and a very interesting and rewarding profession of, for using geophysics for the location and identification and management of sub, subsurface resources. Geophysics has and continues to be to contribute to the betterment of humanity through the location of water, prediction of hazards from earthquakes, landslides, and tsunamis. In fact, my first experience when I had ended up at the School of Mines was a headline in, in an article in the Rocky Mountain News, Mines Geophysicists Find Water for the City and Town of Vail, Colorado. We, um, in, in 2008, at the um, urging of Craig Beasley, SEG founded a Geoscientists Without Borders. It was in response to the devastating tsunami and earthquake in uh, Sumatra in 2004. Since 2008, 39 GWB projects have taken place in 28 countries, focusing on water management, earthquake, landslide, volcano, tsunami re um, preparedness, habitat management, archaeology, and pollution mitigation. 2018 marks the 10th anniversary of GWB with special sessions and a special celebration at this meeting. Also this year, we're awarding the first ever Craig Beasley Award for Social Contribution in Geophysics on, tu in tu on Tuesday evening. Paul Bauman Geophysics has led several of these projects all over the world for in search for water resources, and he'll be getting that award. The other thing that SEG does is we increase the marketplace for exchange of technical and knowledge and products. As Dan said, this is a perfect example of geophysicists from all over the world coming together to share knowledge and, and experience. The last time the SEG meeting was held in Anaheim was 1988. This year, <clears throat> in, in that vein, we have collaborated with a number of, of sister societies on a number of projects and participated in several other meetings around the world. We continue to work towards hosting and, and collaborating on workshops and conferences in India, China, Middle East, through our regional advisory committees. <clears throat> the other thing that is fundamental to SEG and its uh, members is to be the trusted go-to source for information about applied geophysics. The original flagship publication, Geophysics, was started in 1936 with a, a few number of papers. Leading Edge was introduced in the late 70s, exposing people to a slightly less formal review of emerging technologies and other information. The latest addition to our journals was the Interpretation Journal, a collaboration with AAPG, focusing on interpretation of geophysical projects with products, which personally, as a longtime interpreter, feel is the most important thing that we as geophysicists can do to 
communicate the value of, of what we do in terms of using our technology to build models and understand the subsurface. Another, beyond journals, we have a lot of the fundamental um, textbooks that have enabled the advancing of our science of applied geophysics. What about diversity? The Star Trek bridge scene that, I, that I'm picturing here illustrates what in the 1970s was intended to portray a fully diverse and neutral um, leadership of the Starship Enterprise. SEG started with a, with a woman who essentially kept the society alive in its early years. And a few short years later, in 2000, we had our first women president, followed by a few other short years <laughs> as their second one. Last year marked the first time that all three major societies were led by, by women presidents. There's Denise Cox, uh, current president of AAPG, Janine Judah, past president of SPE, and I was, in, I was president-elect for SEG. I continue to travel around the world and, and engage with, with students everywhere that promise to increase our diversity going forward. To that end, in 2011, Klaus Koster instigated the SEG Women's Network Committee. They sponsor and encourage inclusion and diversity in the society and the profession around the world. There's a number of, of events at this conference, and that continue. Please avail yourself of them. The other thing that we worked really hard on is the fact that coming in as a leadership and onto the board of this society, it became apparent that over the years, we have continued to grow organically grow a large number of programs and committees. In fact, there's there's... 57, now 58 committees in SEG, and it becomes a little bit confusing coming in as leadership to try and prioritize where to focus your, your energy and, and resources. So to that end, a lot of these different programs have been organized into buckets or portfolios that are managed by the board of directors with the SEG senior management team. The only new, new committee that we found, formed was the planning and strategy, which is an effort to facilitate uh, long-range planning and, and business planning for, for all of the committees. The next thing that we, we've recognized after SEG started to uh, evaluate a uh, certification program was the fact that there's a gap between when a student leaves the university and they become a qualified contributing professional. So many of that, those students in the, in the early years of my career facilit were, got that initial and criti and critical training through training programs at, at major oil companies. And often the WANTADs would say five to ten years major oil company experience and that meant it was some sort of a certification. That is becoming harder and less prevalent as we go forward. So what SEG has, is suggesting is that we could fill in some of that gap that's becoming larger and larger by continuing to enable our student early career, transition, late career programs that currently exist and that may exist in the future and potentially a virtual internship. One of the programs that, that we've been developing in the last few years with under an initial grant from Halliburton is called Evolve, and it currently involves 60 students in 10 multidisciplinary virtual teams that, that meet and evaluate exploration problems. This year, they're, they're ready to present their results, and we have opportunities for further engagement in programs like Evolve. So finances became 
pretty pretty nice going into the 2014 2015 with reve revenues continually growing. We did suffer a couple of years of losses in 2015 and 16, but we're able to quickly mitigate those. And we currently are enjoying slight surpluses, but very well controlled finances. Where are we headed for in the in the future? We hope to expand into Asia, Africa, and South America through various means, strengthening our position in the core value of applied geophysics and communicating that return on investment to our stakeholders. In new business development, we are looking into the artificial intelligence machine learning realm because that is kind of a natural expansion and extension, and geophysicists have already been working in this arena for 15 to 20 years from what I can tell. And to fill in that gap that I just talked about in the post between graduation and becoming a, a contributing a qualified geophysicist. One of the big initiatives is a partnership with sister organizations to host the first um, multi-society conference on the digital transformation of oil and gas currently slated for the second quarter, early second quarter of 2019, likely in Austin, Texas. The Scene Corporation is another uh, unique, uh, unique feature of SEG, which is an advanced modeling corporation. It started in about 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, and it created seismic simulation and geophysical simulation based on very detailed geologic models. It's transformed into including time lapse and dynamic reservoir modeling, and now can pro provide the ground groundwork for testing machine learning algorithms and uh, <clears throat> helping to provide formats and a, a global communications network around this emerging and important technology. So where do we see as, uh, geophysics going in 2040? Uh, there's a strong emergence and a number of smart cities are currently being de designed where most of the, um, that will be environmentally neutral. SC, um, drones should be used not only in acquisition and, and artificial learning and in processing of data, so that should shorten the cycle of geophysics, which is critical to our stakeholders. And I read that uh, the computers in 2040 will use more electricity than the world is able to produce. So we're going to need some technological breakthroughs to achieve that. So with that, I would like to introduce Daryl Willis, who is a, um, the vice president. Oh, I've got, sorry, I'm going to introduce myself again. <laughs> who is that? <laughs> He's the Vice President of Oil and Gas at Google Cloud. Um, he's earned his Master of Science in ma Science Management from Stanford University with concentrations on managing global business and social responsibility, a Master of Science in Geology and Geophysics from the University of New Orleans, and a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry and Literature from Northwestern University. He currently lives in Silicon Valley, and I will leave the rest to him to illustrate his, um, his contribution and his technology at Google Cloud. Good morning, everyone. I'm really, I'm really, uh, I'm really excited uh, to be here. Um, Dan and Nancy, thank you for the, um, there you are, Dan. Thank you. Thank you for um, having me. And uh, to everyone in the audience, thank you for being here um, and joining me for the uh, time we have together today. For those of you who might be wondering, why in the world is someone from Google, more specifically Google Cloud, standing on this stage? I'll tell you why. But you have to indulge me for just a moment why, while I introduce myself. First of all, I'll start by saying that by training, I'm actually, I was a geophysicist. 
I studied, as uh, Nancy mentioned, at the University of New Orleans back in the, in the early 90s uh, under uh, Laura Serpa and Terry Pavlis, who uh, were very courageous to take me in as a student, considering my background was really chemistry and literature and not necessarily geology and geophysics. I actually did my thesis research in California in Death Valley, and so it's kind of fitting that we're in Anaheim because... Um, it resonates with me being back in California, not only living in Silicon Valley, but also because I did my thesis research here in the SEG conferences here. Study the, I studied the intersection of the Southern Death Valley Fault Zone with the Gorlock Fault in Southern Death Valley. I actually had to design an acquisition. I had to process it and interpret it, which were things I'd never done before. I'm surprised I actually made it out of graduate school. Actually, I thought I was going to graduate in two years, but Laura and Terry informed me that it was actually going to take almost three but I did it. The other thing I would say, just as I reflect on my journey to this particular place, is that um, I received funding from the Society of Exploration Geophysicists back when I was a graduate student for two summers, or two years. I think it was about $1,000, Nancy, which was quite a lot of money back in 1991. And it actually was designed to help me travel from New Orleans to Death Valley to do the research and to hire some field assistants to help me do the research that I was doing for my thesis. So in many respects, I would not be here today had I not had that $1,000 in 1991 and 1992 because I had no way of accessing that kind of money. So I'm really, really grateful to this organization for the uh, investments they make in students, graduate and undergraduate students. After graduating from UNO, in 1993, I actually joined Amico, a company called Amico, which was equipped subsequently uh, acquired by uh, BP in 1998. I joined Amico in 1993 as a seismic processor. And I worked across various technology teams in Houston doing pretty standard processing uh, for seismic data back then. And then once I perfected my craft as a generic processor, I was able to do some AVO processing. And then I worked across the Gulf of Mexico in the offshore shallow waters of the Gulf of Mexico, but also in the deeper waters of the Gulf of Mexico over time. I worked on exploration and development projects for BP in Russia and in Vietnam and the onshore U.S. And most recently in that photo, I was actually working in the offshore water, deep waters of the uh, country of Angola, where I was actually the business unit leader for BP's oil business uh, in Angola in uh, blocks 31 and 18. One of the most exciting things I remember about my career was not when I graduated in 1993, but what I remember was when I discovered my first, I, I drove my first well and had my first oil discovery in 1998 in New Orleans, Eugene Island 273, the B31 sidetrack, B13 sidetrack. I remember it very, very well. And uh, it was one of the most exciting days of my life because I felt like I finally, I finally could call myself an oil and gas person. I perfected my craft, and I actually found oil and gas. And I did that over and over again um, over the course of my career, which is quite exciting, until I drilled the C-11 sidetrack, which was a dry hole. <laughs> and it's still, I still believe that well should have worked. And I, it, it, it haunts me to this day. But things have progressed um, a lot over the years as I reflected on my remarks today. But in many ways, things are still the same. And in my humble opinion, the rate of progression for our industry, for the oil and gas industry, is too slow. So after 25 years in the industry, on the oil and gas side of the fence, I was ready to see if I could help accelerate the journey that we're on from a different place, which is why I made a decision, from a different vantage point, I should say, which is why I made the decision to join Google Cloud. Google Cloud. And at Google, and Google Cloud more specifically, we are building an energy startup inside of Google to help accelerate this much talked about digital transformation. That is, as I said, and you hear me say over and over this morning, it's taking way, way too long. And I worry about the pace of change, and I worry about the, the lack of velocity in the pace of change. And it's easy to think, it's really easy to think that we've got a lot of time and that time is not of the essence, but time is actually of the essence. And there's a term that was used or a statement that was used back in the 60s and 70s that I think is appropriate. 
for us to think about. And it was, it's uh, time for us to think about the fierce urgency of now. That is a real, real statement that is really, really true. And those of you who do not fully embrace this journey that entails all things digital, those of you who do not embrace this journey that entails all things digital will ultimately become a casualty of this journey. Data is not only coming at us with more intensity from all kinds of devices, sensors at the surface, sensors at the subsurface, sensors on the edge. It's coming from depositional layers inside the earth as well. And I think there's a huge opportunity for us. There's a huge opportunity in front of us, I should say. And we can either dodge that opportunity or attempt to dodge it, or we can actually dance with that opportunity. And I would assert and suggest that we should dance with the opportunity that is in front of us when it comes to leveraging all of the data that we have at our disposal. One of the co-founders of an organization inside of Google called Google Brain said that it's not the company with the best algorithm that will win. It's the company with the most data. And luckily, we live in a world where there is simply no shortage of data. The folks in this room know that better than I do. And in fact, more data has been created in the last two years than in the previous 5,000 years of humanity. And that's a pretty big statement, but it's true. But let me ask you this. this. In your work today, how much data is being generated? How much of the data are you actually using to make decisions or to derive insights? Is it where it should be in the 21st century? Or are you where you should be in the 21st century? I'd ask you the question, can we do better? Can you do better? Reports suggest that across the energy industry, companies are using somewhere between 1% to 5% of the data that they have access to. Another question, do you think that's good enough? My assertion is that we can do a lot better. I know for a fact, and I know you know for a fact, that there's a lot of data trapped in spreadsheets, in reports, in PowerPoint slides, and it in Word documents, in file cabinets, in vaults, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a, lot of J, a da, there's a lot of data being generated as we speak, from hundreds of pieces of data or bits of data to hundreds of thousands of pieces of data on sensors that are on drilling rigs or that are on seismic vessels or on FPSOs or on platforms or on pads. On the edge, data is being generated in real time, and it's way more than we can handle. But the time is now, and action is required from us now as we move forward. Because if we're going to truly embrace the future, and if we're going to truly deliver energy to the world to help light up the world in a much better way than it's currently lit based on the slide that Nancy showed us, we've got some work to do. And I'll say more about that in a minute. So we've got to get into action as an industry. You've got in to get into action as scientists. Or we'll get left behind. Those that do not embrace this digital journey will likely exceed in the short term, but they will not exceed over the long term. And frankly, the world is counting on all of us in energy to do something about the fact that there are still a billion people on the planet who do not have access to any form of energy. And to do something about the fact that there are three billion people on the planet who still cook on indoor fires inside their homes, such that indoor air pollution kills more people than AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. Energy needs to be accessible. It needs to be affordable and it needs to be as clean as possible. So what can we do about it? What is Google Cloud and Google going to do about it? 
I'm glad you asked me that question. So I want to talk through a few examples, a few examples of how we're starting to just scratch the surface, or I should say scratch the subsurface in many cases. Fact, artificial intelligence and machine learning will impact significant parts of the value chain. That's a fact. Just think about it. From the digitization of legacy studies that are filled with a wealth of information, much of which many of you and I over the course of my career have created, full of historical context, context all the way through to how we build Earth models that will allow us to efficiently and effectively optimize hydrocarbon extraction in unconventional reservoirs on through to deep water deposition of systems. In addition, there's a huge opportunity for us to reduce the cycle time. I'll come back to this over and over again. Required to access data and to organize data in an easily accessible way, such that explorers and development geoscientists and production geoscientists can spend their time exploring and developing or looking for production enhancement opportunities to deliver affordable energy to the world. Some of the big messages I'd like to leave with you in regards to this slide are as follows. In using AI and ML, we should be able to deliver a dramatic reduction in cycle time that has not, to be frank, been delivered so far. From report access to model build, I believe we can do more and collectively we can do better. Second point I'd like to leave you with is that the pace of integration of old data and new data has got to be accelerated. Third, we know that algorithms are seeing more in data than human beings can. And don't get me wrong, our judgment as scientists is priceless, but we're seeing examples in healthcare where machines are more consistent than humans, particularly in the area of radiology and the diagnoses of things like breast cancer, where we have seen in our research fluctuations in the precision of diagnoses based on time of day. I'll say more about that. Mornings, good diagnoses around lunchtime and toward the end of the day, slightly not so good. So, but with machines, with machines, the, diag the consistency in the diagnoses is stable throughout the course of their, uh, their work. So I think there's a huge opportunity for us to learn from other industries and to bring that into our profession. And to think about artificial intelligence or AI as more of a, an assistant to us. It's not a replacement for us, it's, it's an assistant to us. And I believe it can ultimately make us better. Fact number four, in our business, experience and judgment will always matter. It will always matter. I believe that. There are a lot of similarities between what we're doing in healthcare, in particular what we're doing inside of Google and Google Cloud in healthcare and life sciences, and what we're attempting to and beginning to do in the energy sector and with the geosciences. Similarities in terms of the data condition or lack thereof, similarities in terms of image interpretation, similarities in terms of the importance of patterns, and the fact that the brain may have some possible similarities to a reservoir, given its complexity. So there's some amazing work going on in neuroscience right now that we might be able to learn from and apply to the subsurface. And at Google Cloud, we ultimately believe in the democratization of artificial intelligence such that it is fast, such that it is accurate, and more importantly, that is absolutely useful. It must be useful. And I know I'm probably starting to sound like a broken record. We've recently celebrated the 20th birthday or anniversary of Google. Google was actually founded in 1998. That is hard to believe, but it's true. And since the beginning, our mission has been around organizing the world's information 
such that it is accessible and such that it is useful. I would say that digitizing the world's information has been a part of Google's mission statement, too. And as you know, like I do, information management has been a problem for most industries, but it has been a big challenge for the oil and gas industry. I actually think we went through a period in the 90s where we had a healthy, we didn't necessarily have a healthy respect for data. We actually had a healthy disrespect for data. And I think we were very dismissive of data. I might say more about that in a minute as well. Legacy data is also very hard to recover and sometimes even difficult to access. That said, organizing information to make it accessible is what we do. That is what we do at Google. And we're working and we will be working with you to help you integrate your internal data with the world's data. The idea being making it even more valuable and helping you to better understand the relationship of all of this new information as you make your decisions, such that you can make better decisions as we move forward when it comes to oil and gas exploration and development. To be a bit more specific, as the, the oil and gas industry has loved data of all kinds, I, act, I actually remember back in the late 90s and early part of uh, 2000s having to fight with engineers for logging runs, for seismic reprocessing, for rock property studies as a geoscientist working in the Gulf of Mexico, trying to make the case that data would deliver more insights. It would give, give us more understanding. It would potentially provide us with more opportunities. It was always a tough sell. In many cases, engineers would easily get the data that they wanted. But for a long time, there was a mystery about the value of geophysics in the oil field and the value of that data. Today, the stakes are even higher, given the computational power available, given the access to the cloud and its, its elasticity, and our access to robust data analytics, artificial intelligence, and machine learning capabilities. Today, everyone is throwing around, everyone's throwing around the right words around AI and ML and transformation and digitization. But the urgency is not nearly where it needs to be. And guess what? It is not going to be an easy journey. It's not an easy journey. It's going to be hard. There is no... There is no magic, uh, there's no secret sauce, there's no quick fix. It's going to be a very difficult journey. But I believe that we can do it. One of the things I like about Google is that we like really, really hard problems. And we like doing things that are not easy to do. And I think we will have our hands full um, with uh, the energy industry for the rest of this decade and into the next. But I'm really excited about that, that challenge. Now I want to say a few words about pace. I want to say a few words about pace and the time it takes to get things done. Frankly, I think there needs to be an acceleration, as I've said a thousand times already, around the pace. And we must challenge ourselves, you must challenge us in your institutions and your companies to do things faster. In today's competitive world, bigger is no longer good enough. And bigger doesn't always guarantee that you're going to beat slower. But what we do believe is that faster, bigger doesn't always guarantee you're going to be smaller, but what we do believe is that faster will beat slower. And we do not have the luxury, as we have historically, of taking our time. So let me say this in a different way, in a more formal way. I'll try it like this. The way we do things, our workflows, workflows historically have been too slow. I'm confident that we can do better and leverage past knowledge to accelerate the delivery of products that previously took years to develop and create. In other words, we need to get into action. We need to move faster. I think I like the way I said it the first way, the first time. The industry, and frankly, the world needs us. The industry and the world needs us thinking about how we can make the best informed decisions using as much data as possible 
under the belief that it will ultimately make us better and give us access to more energy. We need to look at more data, and we need to, we need to find more insights from derivative data, such as evaluating hundreds of attributes, for example, pretty much doing things that we could not do at pace in the past. Making the absolute most of your data and the expertise of the explorationists interacting with the data will most certainly and ultimately help us increase drilling success rates and precision, as well as better understand geology and geophysics in a much deeper way than we do today. So we need to push hard. We need to push hard using data. We need to push hard using our collective minds, your collective minds, and intellect. We have got to believe as an industry in the possibility of breakthrough thinking to truly disrupt how we do things and to ultimately transform work processes and workflows. Otherwise, nothing will change and we will get the status quo. On the current slide, what I'm inferring here is meant to be really, really provocative. And some of you might argue that it's crazy and I'm out of my mind. But let me say a few more words about it. We have got to start being bolder and taking bigger chunks of time out of the things we do on the journey that we're on. So, for example, at Google, we're doing things with autonomous vehicles that we struggled a decade ago to get the automotive industry in because they thought that time was going to come sometime well into the middle of this century. So we're doing crazy things with autonomous vehicles inside of Google to a company we have called Waymo. We're actually experimenting with hot air balloons on the edge of space with the intent of delivering the internet to the most remote locations on the planet. We actually have a company that has uh, created a contact lens that will measure blood glucose levels for di diabetics such that they don't have to stick themselves every day to determine what their blood sugar levels are uh, or, or through the course of a day in some cases. So we've done some really big, challenging things inside of Google. And I mention those because if some of those things could be done in the areas of healthcare and uh, technology and transportation, surely, surely we can figure out how to cut cycle times and transform cycle times in service of progress and in service of pace, such that more time can be consumed thinking about exploration opportunities and development opportunities and production enhancement opportunities for the world. I want to see explorationists, for example, doing what they do best, using their expertise, their brains, their intellect to explore, and less on abstract and menial tasks. In this scenario, we all win, because ultimately we drill more wells, we access more resources, we drill more intelligent wells with increased knowledge, and I guarantee you better insights. So let's try a few things. I would assert that we should be working on and thinking about how do we reduce the cycle time it takes to acquire and process seismic data from years to weeks? How do we reduce the interpretation time from years to weeks? How do we build hoppers and lead inventories in months or a month and not a year? And how do we plan a well in a day? and drill it safely. Those are big challenges, but those are the things we've got to reach for and fight for as an industry. And I believe that anything is possible in this modern era, era in particular, using AI and ML, I believe that these things can be done. Other industries are pushing boundaries more aggressively, and it is time for us to do the same. We have got to push ourselves. I have a couple of more things to say, and then I'll be done. The oil and gas industry in particular, in my opinion, is behind in adopting 
emerging technologies. In this slide, you could easily think you're looking at a core, a thin section, or some seismic attribute generated from a 3D volume. But we're not. Most of the images on this slide are from the brain. Actually, they're from the brain of a fly. With the exception of the bottom left-hand slide, which is a channel system that's been mapped on a seismic volume that was taken from the Schlumberger website. And I show you this to make a point. Deep neural nets and other algorithms in artificial intelligence will give us a much better understanding of our data going forward. Neuromancer, deep neural networks with flood feeling segmentation algorithms look a lot like channels and core. That is what you see on this slide. I would assert that the segmentation of neural pathways and nerve centers is probably a very difficult problem to solve. But the challenge is being taken on by the healthcare and life sciences industry. And we need to apply those lessons with the same conviction and courage that are being applied in healthcare and to the brain to our understanding of the subsurface and our earth models. At Google, we're building state-of-the-art tools like Neuromancer, which will accelerate and we will use the, we will try to uptake these technologies in the energy industry to accelerate our understanding of how we can take the lessons learned from the deconvolution of the brain and apply those lessons to the subsurface and ultimately to the energy industry. Google is truly impacting other industries in the area of artificial intelligence, particularly in the area of healthcare and life sciences, as I said. And I'm confident that we will be able to translate some of these impacts. I'm hopeful that we'll be able to translate some of these impacts into the energy industry. But your help is going to be required. So we need to actually start by starting. And you don't need a big, complicated project to do something that could make an impact on the bottom line of your business, of your university, of your institution. But I will insist that we can no longer afford to wait. And that there's no reason for us to go it alone. As a matter of fact, we can't go alone on this journey. We have to go together. It's important that we find partners, that you find partners whose expertise combines with your own in service of making substantial progress. It's important that you push hard. It's important that you don't accept the current reality. It's important that you don't accept the status quo. In this slide on the left, you see solutions that we provide inside of Google. And on the right, you see solutions that companies are looking for, specifically energy companies are looking for. These are the digital transformations that are underway today as we see them, some of them. We have been working across the industry over the course of the last year, and frankly, over the course of the last two years, with companies like Schlumberger and Baker Hughes GE and Total and Repsol and Equinor and Chevron and most recently, Anadarko. We've also been working with key partners to help enable us on this challenging journey. Partners like Icon Science and Cognite and Novi Labs and Spark Cognition and a host of others who are working with us to see if we can crack this nut, this challenge, so to speak. There are solutions out there waiting to be applied to our industry, and we are determined that we will be a part of that journey, journey as we move forward through this year and through the rest of the decade and decades to come. And it's an exciting time. I'll close by saying it's an exciting time for the industry. We say at Google Cloud that we have a healthy, at Google I should say, we say we have a healthy disregard for the impossible. And this journey sometimes feels impossible. But I will tell you that we can do this. We simply have to work together to accelerate the velocity of the journey that we're on. And remember, there is no silver bullet. 
we're going to have to ground this one out, grind this one out together. There is no silver bullet. We've got to grind this one out together. So thank you for listening this morning. Thank you for your time. And I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. And Dan and Nancy, welcome to, you're welcome to join me on the stage. We, we have a couple of questions already, but after you've heard both Daryl and Nancy's uh, presentations, you'll see on your seat some uh, three-by-five cards and some pencils. Um, if you have any questions, write a question, pass it on to the aisle, and we'll, we have some people walking around that will be able to take it. I have a, a couple of starter questions, but you know, I, I would really like to have some questions after we've, we've heard both the presentations, uh, that we have some questions about the presentations. And thank you for taking time to take some questions. And um, so the first question I have um, is for Daryl. And um, the question is, how do you see the future of the oil and gas industries? Um, I think it's, it's at an inflection point. My observation, Dan, and everyone, as I've uh, spent the last seven months in my role at Google, is that um, there are various rates to this journey. My observation is that the companies that are making the most progress so far have been the small and medium-sized companies. Um, they seem to be able to get their heads and their hands around the, the agenda uh, in a way that the larger companies are struggling to do. I also think that um, the companies that are most successful right now on this journey are those companies where there's a lot of momentum in the front lines of the organization, but there also um, there's a significant amount of sponsorship in the executive um, suite or in the boardroom. So when those two things coexist, I think there's an opportunity to really deliver uh, progress. The third thing I would say is that companies that are being very, very successful are those companies that are not getting stuck doing POCs, proof of concepts, but they're moving through PLCs and scaling when they find something that has the opportunity to be successful. So I believe that the journey is going to be, the transformation is going to be led by smaller and medium-sized companies. I think it's going to be led by startups and uh, in the energy space. And uh, I hope that the, the larger companies become fast followers. The bigger IOCs become fast followers. Oh, thank you. Um, Next question we have is, is for Nancy. Uh, if I'm an early career geophysicist, how should I be involved with SEG? Um, there are a number of opportunities, and I'd really like to see anybody as early as they can conceive of it get involved. We have the EPIC committee, which is specifically targeted to early career professionals, but all of the committees, any committee, we are really anxious to have you participate in the research committee, the Women's Network. All of these, SEAM is always looking for, for volunteers as well, and it's going to be an integral part of this digital transformation as well. Okay. Thank you. I think there's some questions coming up, too. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, a question for, for Daryl. Um, will the Googles of the world make current oil and gas software companies also obsolete? <laughs> <laughs> the, intent is to, the intent is to, for Google, to bring the capability that it's created over the last two decades, decades to bear on the industry. It's, it is not to... to uh, do a couple of things. It's not to start our own oil company. That's the big question I get a lot, Dan. Nancy, is, are you guys trying to start an oil company? It's absolutely not. It is not to run anyone out of business, but it is really to take all of the capability that has been built up in Google in the areas of data analytics and machine learning and artificial intelligence and security and infrastructure, and they've all been applied inside of Google, and they all sit behind things like Search and Android and G Suite and Photos, and to bring all of that expertise that we've been using internally to make Google the great company that it is to bear on industries like healthcare and retail and 
uh, energy and financial services. So no, that is not the intent. It is to be a partner uh, of choice and the platform of choice for the industry going forward. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so another one, we'll switch back and forth for, for Nancy. How, how do you motivate, how do we better motivate geology students to learn computer info science? Um, that's right. <laughs> um, computer information science. Okay. Um, it's, uh, it's a challenge, I understand. I had to write programs as a student, and it is truly my worst skill. I don't like writing code. <laughs> I never wanted to write code, but I think it's really important that the geoscientist understand the mechanics of the digital world because there, you're never going to replace that human capability of judgment. So as, as challenging as it seems to become digital and a computer science and an IT savvy person, without the human judgment, I think that um, our science it will, will suffer. So gut through it, I guess, is the <laughs> Okay. Embrace it and get through it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, so this next one is uh, one that interests me also. So, you know, a large part of our audience here is oil and gas. Um, here, this, this question's for Daryl. Is um, but alternative energies, so the solars, the uh, um, and, um, and like that of the world, is, is an important part of the energy mix and, and affects what we do. But so, how does does Google have a plan to work on alternative energy? Yes, the short answer is yes. In, in, in my role as, uh, as VP of Oil and Gas and Energy, um, it, it, it will encompass quite a few things. Um, we're initially focused on oil and gas because we think there's a big opportunity in that space. But we're also in active conversations with power companies and utility companies. We're actually having conversations with renewable companies, primarily solar and wind companies. We're also even having some interesting conversations with mining companies who are trying to sort of up their, their technological game as well. So the expectation is that under my division, um, there will uh, be the full suite of energy uh, relationships that are being cultivated because we think it's going to take all of them to deliver energy to this one billion, these one billion people that I referenced in my, my remarks. So we will be covering renewables as well. As a matter of fact, Google, the other thing I would say about Google is that our cloud is 100% is powered by green energy. Uh, I think, Nancy, you mentioned something about data centers you know, consuming more energy than is available currently in the, on the planet. And right now, I think if you look at the energy usage across the world, U.S. is number one, China second, and data centers are third in terms of the amount of energy consumed globally. And so we are consciously trying to make sure that as we build data centers to, to run all of the systems and infrastructure that we uh, and, and, and technology that we have, that they're running on green energy. So we're going to kind of live in a world where we engage the full spectrum okay. going forward. Very Long good. answer to a short, short question. Sorry. Okay. Well, actually, I'd like to follow that a little, sure. little bit. Is that so part of SEG, you know, we do energy more in oil and gas and like that. We actually have a mining uh, focus also. And so when we talk about energy, are, are you looking at the mining energy, uranium, uh, like that, or, or minerals in general, the coppers, the uh, rare earths and like that? It's, it's been... The conversations we've had primarily have been with, with coal companies, okay. and companies that are mining coal, uh, particularly in uh, places outside of the U.S., where coal is still a big okay. contributor to the, e e the economy okay. and to the energy economy in particular. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you. Wow. That's a question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, this one's a question for Nancy. Um, I think you... you touched on this a little in your, your, your uh, presentation. Can you please speak about the EVOLVE program and how the EVOLVE program prepares students for future careers in geoscience? Yes, e EVOLVE is, a, a, it epitomizes where we want to go with experiential learning and it's virtual, all the, the software and the data is delivered through the cloud. 
Currently, it's only touching about, I think it's 10 teams. But the idea is to enable delivery of the exploration and evaluation process and data through the current and emerging technologies so that young people and students, and I think that even early career or that in that, that awkward gap would benefit from being able to have access to not only evolve on a, on a scholarship basis as it's being offered now, but potentially as a postgraduate study area. But it is a program for doing the life cycle that Daryl spoke of virtually in teams that are located throughout different places in the world. Right now, our teams are scattered all across the, the globe. Thank you. Um, so, so this next question is, is for Daryl. With the vast amount of data and its rate of generation, how to balance the efforts between handling these data and basic research um, and, and how to capture key information and um, integrate them? Is that clear? No. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, I don't have a name on here. <clears throat> yeah. Let's come back to this. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, is there a um, a limit size to transferring to transfer geophysical data to the cloud? For, for instance, thirteen petabytes. <laughs> <laughs> there are four more people at our Google Cloud booth that are best placed to answer that question than me. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Uh, this one's for Nancy. And sh should we, SEG, be training geophysicists in ma machine learning or training uh, data science scientists in geophysics? I think absolutely both. <laughs> um, I think it's our job as geophysicists to transfer our knowledge as best we can to non-geoscientists. So that way, when you're writing code to describe a, a geophysical process or product, it, you need to be able to communicate the why and the how and how that's going to translate into the rocks and the physics of the situation. So I think the short answer is both. Ben, may I? Yes, please. To, to what Nancy said, because I think it's a very important point. Um, when I joined Google in March, I was the first employee they hired um, into this energy business unit that we're creating. And um, by the end of the year, I have 10 people. Probably by the end of the year, next year, I have 50 to 100 people on my team. Most of them will be industry, 99% of them will be industry people. And the reason for that is the fact that Google's got all of this capability that I described but it does not have the subject matter expertise that's required to truly build a bridge to the industry. So we will be you know, building out a team that has expertise in oil and gas and renewables and utilities and power and mining to help us understand the problems and making sure that we make the right, create the right solutions going forward. So it's a very, very important point. That's great. So the next, next question for Daryl, um, I think, um, expands, is asking for a little expansion of uh, uh, an answer you gave earlier. Uh, the data examples you show about Google's collaboration only involves large uh, oil and gas companies. Where do you see small and independence in this equation? I think that the, uh, so a couple of things. One, the only, the only independent I think I mentioned was Anadarko because they're the only one. Anadarko, and I guess, well, Equinor is probably not considered independent. But Anadarko I'm only allowed to talk about companies that have given me permission to talk about them. So there are lots of things that are going on with a variety of uh, small and medium-sized companies. I'm just not, for competitive reasons and without their permission, able to, to describe those things. But uh, when I arrived at Google, there was a big focus and interest in building relationships with some of the bigger companies for obvious reasons because of their scale. But my observation, having spent 25 years in one, is that um, we have to do that. But the pace at which we can build and get momentum is a lot less. Um, and that most of the momentum that we've been able to create so far, 
caveat being I've been at Google for seven months, six and mm -hmm. seven months, has been with the small and medium sized companies. I'm just not able to, to openly talk about them in the same way I can about some of the larger ones. Okay. Uh, next one's to, to Nancy. An interesting uh, question. Uh, what is the geophysical challenging problem that hasn't been resolved yet? <laughs> um, uh, A stumper. There, yeah, it, it is. It's it's challenging. I mean, there's there's too many things coming into my ha mind, but I think that the biggest challenge to our industry is, as you described, is shortening the cycle time. And I think we'll have to have the machine learning to, to do that. As an interpreter, one of the biggest challenges is the amount of information that generated and how my brain can physically sort that out and translate that into an earth model and then communicate that to somebody else. So, you know, there's there's space geophysics and geology of Mars. There's, <laughs> there are some fascinating problems, but I think the, 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 maybe the biggest challenge is, is translating what we do into a transformation of the planet and getting, getting affordable, clean energy pushed out. Cool. Um, next question is for Daryl. Very, very important question since, you know, we're a very education-oriented um, uh, society, and especially, you know, we're having the great crew change out there. Um, what would be your suggestion for students in early careers as for getting training in the field of AI? To not run from it, but to run towards it. And inside of your um, academic institutions, if there are opportunities to take a course in uh, artificial intelligence and more specifically machine learning to, to, to take those courses. If there's an opportunity to learn how to write code, as painful a process as it is to do it, because I think there's going to be a, a, an incredible need for uh, computational, quantitative uh, geoscientists who really deeply understand and get uh, artificial intelligence uh, going forward. I'd also suggest reading a book called Machine Platform and Machine Platform Cloud, which I think is a fantastic read as an introduction to getting you excited about the possibility of uh, the power of artificial intelligence. It talks about how the world has been changed uh, in terms of think about how we listen to music. iTunes has transformed how music is purchased and listened to. Uber and Lyft have transformed how we move around. Airbnb has transformed how we, in some cases, shop for accommodations. Uh, Amazon has pretty much altered the retail industry in terms of how we shop for goods and services. So these are platforms that have been created. And my question is always to audiences, where is that equivalent platform for the energy industry, whether it's oil and gas, renewables, mining, whatever. And so I think read that book, get engaged in some courses, run towards those courses, learn how to code, and you'll be uh, well on your way. Very good. Maybe a follow-up on, on that. So SEG is, uh, you know, um, you know, we, we facilitate professional development like there. What should SEB, SEG be doing to, uh, you know, for member development? And, you know, if this is going to be something big, um, which I believe it is, um, in the future, what, what should we be doing to uh, facilitate the uh, um, implementation? So, and I don't, it may already exist, Dan, but I'm not, I'm not sure because I haven't looked at the full program for this, this week, but I think, making sure there, uh, there's access to courses and expertise, uh, like folks from Google or Microsoft or Amazon or wherever in these areas, available to, to be a part of conferences like this. I think if that's not a, if, if machine learning and artificial intelligence and analytics are not significant features in your programming over the course of a week, then it's a missed opportunity. So making those things available for members to uh, engage in and explore is very, very important. Okay, and just as a plug, we, yeah. we do have, we, we, we've had a, a continuing education course in digital Perfect. transformation. We yeah. have our Business of Applied Geophysics tomorrow. Great. We, you know, we've, we have uh, exhibitors here that are from that space, and um, um, the Google and Friends Hackathon. Yeah, exactly. So um, I think we're just about out of time. Let's see if there's a quick question. 
people. Can so, have pardon me? Someone just, you just got to, just got to. This one right here? Delivery. Special delivery. <laughs> special delivery. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, last one for Daryl. Mm. Uh, sometimes machine learning makes an unpredictable move. For example, Alpha. AlphaGo. AlphaGo, an AI uh, playing for Go made an unreasonable play at the beginning of a game. Most professionals don't agree with it. However, it turned out to be a good decision. How do you continue geo? How do you continue geophysical experts to believe in machine learning? Hmm. <laughs> that, that, that's overcoming skepticism, I guess. Yeah. 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 Um, I think you have to. I, I, I was. I was listening to the question, but I was thinking about AlphaGo. I wasn't sure where you were going with it. Okay, the yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't sure where I was going with it either. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I've just seen, I think one of, the, one of the things that's been really interesting for me, sitting in Silicon Valley and looking back at the industry, is that I get to sit with my colleagues in healthcare and financial services and automotive and media. And... I get to see on the inside all of the instances how, around how Google is using machine learning and artificial intelligence. And it, it, it works to our advantage more than it does not. And so my assertion and my belief is that nothing is perfect. We're on a journey. But the examples I've seen in other industries is that it is more helpful than it is hurtful. And so in order to really stay on this journey in a very pragmatic and proactive way, you've got to just believe that it's going to be more helpful than hurtful. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. And we're, we're out of time for our question and answer period. Why don't we give uh, Daryl and Nancy a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. At seg.org slash podcast, you will find the full show notes for this episode. Follow Seismic Sound Off at seg.org slash podcast to hear new episodes or subscribe for free on your phone. Seismic Sound Off is sponsored by the SEG Wiki, the place to find hundreds of biographies of key geoscientists, open access tutorials, and ongoing translations of SEG's best selling book, Robert Sherris Encyclopedic Dictionary. Type wiki.seg.org into your browser to visit the world's first online geophysics encyclopedia. Original music by Zach Bridges. This episode was hosted, edited, and produced by me, Andrew Gary. Special thanks to the SEG podcast team, Jennifer Crockett, Allie McGinnis, Teresa Reichard, and Mick Sweeney. As well as a special thanks to Rihanna Collier for setting up this recording. Thank you for listening. This is Seismic Sound Off, signaling off. <laughs>